Amen. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you on this beautiful Wednesday evening. Let's grab our red song book. We're going to go to number 115. Number 115. We'll sing all three verses of Sound the Battle Cry. Let's all stand as we sing number 115, Sound the Battle Cry. Join me on the first, number 115. Sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh, raise the standard high for the Lord. Gird your armor on, stand firm everyone, rest your cause upon his holy word. Rouse then, soldiers, round and round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Strong to meet the foe, marching on we go, while our cause we know must prevail. Shield and banner by gleaming in the line, battling for the right we ne'er can fail. Rouse then, soldiers, rally round the banner, Ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throng. O thou God of all, hear us when we come. Help us one and all by thy grace. When the battle's done and the victory's won, may we wear the crown before thy face. Rouse and soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to see everybody this evening. Hopefully you all had a great weekend, and the uh, Lord bless us with a great trip to Vermont and back, and, and a really good time um, at the at the funeral and uh, good, uh, uh, it was a good service. It was good memories. Um, so praise the Lord. Thanks for praying for us and thanks for giving us the opportunity to go. So uh, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stop for prayer and uh, we'll get started this evening. Brother England, do you mind opening us up in prayer, please? Amen. Let's, you can be seated, number 122. Go to number 122. We'll sing the first, second, and the fourth verse of My Jesus, I Love Thee. Number 122. Show me in the first. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, hold the follies of sin I resign my gracious Redeemer my Savior art thou if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now I love thee because thou as first love in me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now in mansions of glory and endless delight. I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with a glittering crown on my brow if ever i love thee my jesus 
it is now. Amen, amen. Let's go to the announcements right quick, and then we'll do our go to our prayer time. Uh, ladies, don't forget that this this uh, Friday night you have your ladies' craft night here at the church at 6 p.m. And so uh, if you're planning on coming, please just make sure that you're signed up on the bulletin board signing sign up sheet. That way we know how many to set up for. And that will be a big help. Also, uh, oh, that's the only announcement that we have. Um, let's go to our prayer time at this time. If you have a pen and paper, you can jot these uh, requests down. If you would be in prayer for uh, Grammy King, or Marilyn is her name. Um, she's our Grammy. But uh, just uh, be in prayer for her. Uh, Marilyn King and also Carol Grosvenor. Um, they both uh, lost their husbands, and um, so be in prayer for them as they are adjusting to a new stage of life. Be in prayer for Katie Whit Levins. Katie Levins. She has surgery on July seventeenth, and uh, her recent bone scan was okay. So we'll be in prayer for her, that the Lord will continue to bless her health. Also be in prayer for Debbie Miller. This is Mrs. Bunny's sister, Debbie Miller, uh, still recovering from the fall, a UTI, and fluid around her lungs again. So be in prayer for her. She's really just going through it. Also, uh, Heidi. Heidi as well, her uh, daughter. Be in prayer for her. Miss Enos, how's Murphy doing? Continue to be in prayer for Murphy. She came home today from the hospital, and um, she's got she's on some medicine and um, recovering. Also, be in prayer for for Josiah. Uh, he's he's been um, feeling under the weather the last uh, day or two. We just um, my wife just talked to. Uh, Miss Peterson, Miss Peterson, they're a family that live down the road, and uh, some of us uh, know them, um, have had uh, business with them. But they have a daughter named Clara. Clara, her health is uh, very delicate, and uh, Miss Peterson just drove by as Melissa was crossing the street, and uh, just about in tears, just asking prayer for Clara. Clara, she's about eight or so, nine years old, and her health has just been very delicate. So just be in prayer for. Clara Peterson, if you would. Be in prayer for Miss Shepherd's mom as uh, her mom's health is deteriorating. I, I believe what I heard on the prayer chain was that uh, they're going to diagnose her for dementia or that they diagnosed her for dementia. They did diagnose her. All right, so be in prayer for Miss Shepherd's mom um, as uh, she's going through um, that right now. And also be in prayer for Steve McIver. Steve Mac McIver. He's uh, got pneumonia. Very, He's very ill, so be in prayer for him. Does anybody else have a prayer request that they would like to add that we should we could be praying for? Yes, sir, Brother Tony. Wow. All right. We'll be in prayer for John Blevins. Please let him know we're praying for him. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Ms. Toller?
uh, be in prayer for the Georges. They are our missionaries down in Argentina. They are traveling today. Also be in prayer for Anna, the daughter of Carlos Donate. And uh, she had uh, some uh, major surgeries that uh, they were here for. And they are traveling. The Donates are traveling back to their mission field. Also, Charlie and uh, Charlie Vest family. And uh, they had to relocate closer to uh, their mom so that they could uh, uh, monitor her. So be in prayer for them. All right. Anybody else? Anybody have a praise? Something you want to praise the Lord for? Yes, Ms. Toller? the Lord. Good. It's exciting. Exciting. Amen. That's great news. Great news. Praise the Lord. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, sir, Brother Tony. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord for Ron's salvation. Wow. Amen. Amen. It's what an inspiration. Amen. Anybody else have a prayer request or a praise that you want to mention? All right. Uh, let's do this. Let's, uh, uh, Brother, Brother Ramsey, do you mind opening us up in prayer? Um, Brother Enos, could you uh, pray second? And then I'll close us. We'll just pray as a group.
Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for loving us. Thank you so much for your blessings upon us. We don't deserve them. Lord, I want to thank you so much for letting us hear about Ron's salvation, Lord, working out this divine appointment between him and Brother Tony, Lord. We, we rejoice with him, and we, we, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for working that all out, Lord. How tenderhearted you are, Lord. How Ron had been stressed out for so long about this situation and how you lovingly orchestrated a meeting at at a store that was totally unplanned by either of them. But Lord, it was all for a purpose for him to come to the realization of Jesus Christ as a Savior. And we thank you so much, Lord, for reaching down and reaching him. I pray that you please do a, a, a special work in his heart. Help him, Lord, not to be satisfied with just being saved, but to be thirsty for more. Go to thirst, put a desire in his heart for more, to know, get to know you more. I pray, the Lord, you please orchestrate, just like you orchestrated this new birth, Lord. Orchestrate uh, Christians that will come along his way and that will help him grow and to know you and to, to, to know the power of your resurrection and, and know, Lord, uh, what you would have him do with his life. We praise you for that, Lord. We praise you for the folks that got saved in the jail this past weekend, Lord. We, give you the honor, the glory, and praise for them. Lord, I ask that you please be with our missionaries, Lord, as, Lord, the Georges are traveling today. Lord, please give them safety. I pray you please be with the Donates as they are traveling back home from being here. I pray, Lord, you please give them safety. Also, help the vests as they are relocating. Help them to be able to get settled and to provide for their every need. Lord, please be with Brother Tony's boss, John. Lord, as he is recovering from this heart surgery, this procedure, I pray that you please give him strength, and I pray that you please draw him closer to Jesus Christ because of all this. I pray, Lord, for little Clara Peterson, Lord. What a sweet little girl she is, so so kind and loving to people. I pray, Lord, that you please be with her right now. Give her peace in her spirit more than anything. Give mom and dad, give them a deep, deep peace, knowing that, that uh, their little girl is in your hands, and you're going to take care of her. I pray, Lord, that you please that you touch her body and heal her, Lord, raise her up, help her, Lord, to be recovered. Be the little Josiah, Lord, as he is feeling under the weather, Lord. I pray that you please strengthen his body, Lord. Lord, uh, I praise and thank you, Lord, for the joy he's given my life and everybody he's around. He just puts a humongous smile on their face, Lord. I pray that you please raise him up, Lord, so that he can continue spreading your joy and your love to the world around him. Lord, I ask that you please be with Grammy. Lord, as she's going through this adjustment time in Grandma Grosvenor, Lord, as she is continuing down this uh, path of getting adjusted, Lord, to, to life alone, I pray that you please put people in their life to, to comfort their hearts, to, to fill the needs of their heart, to, to help them to know that they're needed and that they're wanted and that they're loved. I pray, Lord, you please fill those needs. Lord, take care of them. Lord, I ask that you please be with uh, Lord Heidi Witt and, and Debbie, her mom, Lord, as they are going through some health issues. Please touch their bodies, lift them up, raise them up. I pray you please strengthen them, rejuvenate them, heal them, Lord. I pray, Lord, for Katie Witt Blevins, Lord, as she has the surgery coming up, that you please help uh, everything to go well, prepare her body, Lord. I pray you please touch her body, heal it, Lord, It'll help her body to receive the surgery seamlessly. And, Lord, everything would turn out well, that you would receive the honor and glory for it. Be with little Murphy, Lord, as she, as, uh, she is coming home from the hospital and uh, she is on some medication. I pray that you please help this medicine to, to do its job and to help her to be, feel better. And please heal her, Lord. I pray, Lord, for Miss Shepherd's mom, Lord, as she had the, got the diagnosis of dementia, Lord. I pray that you please, Lord, work in her life and give her special days. I pray, Lord, that you please... Uh, Lord, touch her body and, and uh, give her strength, give her good health. Lord, I ask that you please be with us this evening, Lord, as we gather around your throne. Lord, we love you and we ask that you please teach us. Teach us something from your word, Lord. We need to, to hear from heaven. I pray, Lord, that you please uh, use each song to, to minister to our hearts. I pray that you please encourage our spirits. I pray that you please help us to, to, to see what's, what, what, is so, what is the most important thing for us to do and to, to have in this world. And help us, Lord, to learn that from your word. And help us, Lord, to go out tonight and strive to put it into practice. Lord, I ask that you please meet with us this evening. I pray this all in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Let's grab our red songbook and go to number 90, number 90. And we'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse of Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Number 90. Number 90. We'll sing the first, second, and the fourth verse. Show me on the first. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy way. today whiter than snow Lord wash me just now as in thy presence humbly I bow have thine own way own way, hold o'er my being, absolute sway, fill with thy spirit, till all shall see, Christ only pulpit again. <laughs> um, so Sunday morning on the way to church, uh, corner of Jacob and Kendall Road, the cutest little fawn. It was like miniature. This is probably would have been quite tasty. <laughs> and then I don't know what it is this week, but I've seen little baby coons everywhere, orphans. <laughs> but, uh, tonight's letter is from uh, uh, Dr. and Mrs. Thomas Gilmer, and he's a w wonderful missionary. He's been doing the job a long time. And he says, dear, dear friends of Zion, Linda and I thank you for having made another month of ministry possible by praying and giving. The hundred-year-old Jewess went to be with the Lord on April 18th. He doesn't give her name. <laughs> My contact with her family during this time opened the door for me to be in two synagogues where I witnessed to two rabbis and a rabbinic student. The student said, I want to understand Christianity. The synagogues were of two different Jewish groups. I told one of the rabbis that another rabbi from his group had invited me to have breakfast with him in the old Jewish section of Sao Paulo. And he told me that Shabbat Judaism is closer to Christianity than the other Jewish groups. He asked the name of the rabbi who invited me to breakfast. Uh, I replied, I can keep a secret. <laughs> he will give his name when he wants others to know his opinion. A few days later, I was at a former synagogue transformed into a Holocaust museum. And it's amazing how young people now, they don't even know what the Holocaust was. They've forgotten it. They think it's not real. They think it's just, and they, we need, people need to know. We, we should never forget what happened there. Um, for a ceremony to honor Holocaust survivors and remember the victims, I sat down on the last row of seats. The rabbi in charge of the museum came and escorted me to sit in the front beside the new Jewish, 
new Israeli consul, uh, politician, I mean a diplomat. As always, I gave a track with the address of our first church, uh, Templo Baptista de Indianapolis, to the council and told him how we combat anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism by helping uh, people to become true Christians. I like to give a chick track titled, entitled Love the Jewish People, which tells of the need for salvation and how to be born again. At that event was also one of Brazil's longest serving, very liberal politicians whom I had never met. He gave a very short address. We talked after the event, and I also gave him a gospel witness along with a Love the Jewish People tract. Please read the prayer. I'll, I'll read the prayer, prayer request down below. And, uh, and the prayer, there's a prayer letter um, emphasizing their Bible reprinting fund. Um, thank, you, thank you again for all your help. May God richly bless you all. And he has some praises here. Uh, he had a, a profession of faith. And two, the 100-year-old Jewess who indicated she trusted the Lord graduated to heaven. Three, opportunity to meet and witness to two rabbis, the Israeli consul and one of the longest-serving liberal Brazilian politicians. And four, Harold Ralph is now teaching Biblio Bi Bibliology at the uh, Baptist Missionary Institute, which I helped to start in our early years in Brazil. And a prayer request, one, salvation decisions for Jews and Gentiles. Two, electronic media preparation and publication of Bibles and study helps. And three, need offering for Bible reprinting fund, which is depleted. And four, transition of some pastors of our Brazilian churches. And let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for Brother Gilmer and his wife. And thank you for the wonderful ministry he's been doing in Brazil for these many years. We pray that you'd answer his prayer requests. Uh, we thank you for our service. We pray you're blessed tonight in a special way. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. Let's go to number Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1. And we'll be reading from there, from Romans chapter 1. I want to say thank you to Brother Ramsey and the preacher and Brother Tompkins for filling in this past Sunday. Really, really appreciate it. It was a big, big help. Thank you so much for um, filling in and uh, taking care of the folks. And... Uh, I really appreciate it. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We'll begin with verse 1. It says, Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit, in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means, now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Heavenly Father, again, we ask you, please bless the reading of your word. Please teach us something from your word. Lord, your, your word is eternal. I pray, Lord, you please help us, Lord, to always be hungry, have a, a deep, deep hunger for learning all that we can during our lifetime about your word. Lord, in heaven, we're going to be learning so much more. There are so many wonderful truths. Please, Lord, meet with us this evening. You promised that you would. You said where two or three are gathered together, my name, there am I in the midst. And so I'm asking you to please teach us. Holy Spirit, please come down and teach us all things. We're, we're not uh, in the image of Jesus Christ yet. And so we, we, there's so much for us to learn. So we ask that you please teach us. Please stir our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be challenged. Lord, I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Paul starts out this, this uh, 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 Romans 1 uh, stating how that he was, 
He was Paul, not Saul. He was saved. He was also telling the Romans he was a servant of Jesus Christ. He was also telling them that he was called to be an apostle. He was also telling them that he was separated unto the gospel of God. Many uh, people have, many Christians for many years have, have been uh, separated. They've learned the doctrine of, de- of separation, but it's not to be only separated from something. It's to be separated to something, the gospel of God. And that's what Paul was trying to stress to them. He also, he reminded them of how that this, this gospel of God, in verse 2, it was promised before, by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What a glorious thing the promises of God are. Because of those promises, we can trust God, God's integrity. We can, we, can, uh, we, can put, uh, we can put our faith in His Word because He actually gave us His Word. Amen? Amen. And also, not only that, but we can begin to take partake of the divine nature, as he said in the scriptures, how that these, these great and precious promises were given to us so that we could partake of the divine nature. God wants us to enjoy heaven on earth now. He doesn't want us to have to wait. He wants us to enjoy what it feels like to, to love as he loves and to, to be as joyful and to be giving and generous and all of those wonderful qualities. By those promises that he gave us, we can partake of that divine nature. And also, he wants us to experience all the thrills of forgiveness by both giving and receiving. He also, he, 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 Paul is telling the, the folks how he declared Jesus to be the Son of God. He declared it audibly. He declared it through the, uh, the spirit of holiness. And he declared it by resurrecting him up from the dead. And how that, that as God did that to Jesus Christ, his son, how that we should be challenged as his children to do the same. To both, to both uh, uh, declare it audibly with our voices, to declare it by the spirit of holiness that is in our, in our being, in the way we act, in the way we walk, in the way we talk. But also by the resurrection life of Jesus Christ, by God doing such a deep, intimate work in our life that the old person that people used to know us as has been totally changed because of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Last week we began verse 8, speaking of how that the faith of the Romans was spoken of throughout the whole world, and how that is a reminder for us as God's children that we ought to live our life uh, as so, so much in the image of Jesus Christ that our Christianity, our faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. These Christians, they were in the belly of the beast. They were in the seat of Rome. Uh, you, you studied Rome and all of the idolatry that was going on there, but yet they were living out their Christian faith. As Paul said to the Philippians, that, that, that uh, many salute you, especially they that are of Caesar's household. Even in Caesar's own house, there were people getting saved. There were people living for the Lord right in the seat of, of, of Caesar's household. And how that their, their faith was being spoken of throughout the whole world. That's a testimony. That's a testimony that we still ought to have even to this day. Then last week we talked about how that uh, in verse 9 he says, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit. Paul was saying that he served God with his spirit. He, and uh, he, 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 had a, he had a burden on his heart. God had placed a commission in his heart when he got saved. And, and Paul, he says in verse 16 he's of, of Romans chapter 1, he says, Woe unto me if I, if I don't preach the gospel. He was, he was, he was pressed in his spirit. And, and he, he had to serve God uh, the, uh, before he got saved. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 talk about how, uh, how Paul's life was. He was one of those uh, that the spirit of disobedience was working in. And God had changed his heart. God had changed his life. As we look at Paul and how he served God in his spirit, we, we notice the, uh, in Acts, when in his missionary journeys, we notice that there was, there was a time when he went to the city of Athens, and Athens was a city given to idolatry, and how Paul in his spirit he was stirred by the idolatry all around him. He was also pressed about the city's conditions. He was also purposed to be an agent of change. He, 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 he said in his, in his spirit after seeing what was going on in Athens and thinking, why is it this way? He, he couldn't help but conclude it was because of Rome and its influence. So he said, I'm purposing, I'm determining, I'm going to go to Rome and I'm going to go to the, to the place where this stuff is being propagated from and I'm going to start preaching the gospel and undoing the, the dark 
power that is emanating from there, I'm going to start attacking it there. You see, Paul, in his spirit, he said, I'm going to go down fighting. I'm not going to just let this take over my world in my day. I'm going to stand up against it. You know, the Bible does say that, that uh, the, the Lord lifts up a banner against sin. And that's what we need him to do. We can, we can you know that, 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 that picture of the flag, the, 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 the soldiers that are pulling up that flag, I believe it's in Iwo Jima, where the flag has fallen and they're trying to push it up and pull. That's what we ought to be as Christians. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what the world's doing around us. We're, we're giving our lives to keep that banner high, to keep the standard high, because that's the only thing that's going to push back evil and darkness is the light. Paul said, I serve God with my spirit, and my spirit is going to go down fighting. I'm not just going to lay down and play dead. I'm not just going to let this stuff roll, roll all over me. You know, I, I want to I get to work. I want to... I want to serve God. He was stirred because of the spirit, the, the wickedness that was all over. He was pressed in the spirit of it to do something. He was purposed to be an agent of change. And he was bound. He's determined, I'm going to go down fighting. Verse 9 again, it says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Paul also taught the Christians, taught the believers much about man's uh, uh, relation, man, the, the man's spirit in relation to God's spirit. He wanted us to understand that that the, that man is a multifaceted being. If you notice, if you want to jot this verse down, First Thessalonians five twenty three says, "And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly." That word holy is not the H-O-L-Y holy, like impeccable as we would describe God, Holy Spirit, Holy Father, things like that. No, it's the W-H-O-L-L-Y, which means completely. If you, if you say, I want a whole piece of pie, W-H-O-L-E, whole. Well, this is the adverb form of it. He says, sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless into the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Paul was explaining to the Thessalonians that we are a three-part being. We are spirit, we are soul, we are body. Isn't it amazing how man has that backwards? How, do we, how does man usually say it? Body, soul, spirit. But God says, no, you're a spirit, soul, and body. You see, our, our body is nothing more than a vehicle that transports our soul and our spirit around. That's all it is. God sees us as a spirit, a soul, and a body. He helped the believers understand our inner makeup and how it is created in the image of God. It is how many parts is God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And how many parts is man? Body or spirit, soul, and body. And he wanted to, to help the, the, the believers understand that God wants to sanctify you wholly, entirely, completely. He wants not only to sanctify your body, he also wants to sanctify your soul, and he also wants to sanctify your spirit. He wanted believers to know that there is a powerful relationship between their spirit and what God's Holy Spirit does. Jot this verse down. John 4, verse 23. John 4, 23 and 24, it says, But the hour cometh, and now is, this is Jesus speaking to the lady, the woman at the well, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. They must worship him in spirit and in truth. Saved believers worship the Father with their spirit. That's how you worship the Father, with your spirit. Now notice what Jesus tied together in these portions of what, of what we call the Great Commission. Take, take note especially to the spirit of the disciples. Drop this scripture down, Matthew 28, 17 through 20. Very familiar passage. I'll read it to you. But as I'm reading, I want you to take note of the, of the disciples' spirit. And I want you to, to, to we're going to tie it in on how, how does that relate to us? And why was, why was the atmosphere at this point in time, why was it in the way it was? What was going on? I'll read it and take note of their spirit. Matthew twenty-eight seventeen says, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Who did Jesus say this to? His disciples, correct? What kind of spirit did the men have? What does it say? It says they worshipped him, but some doubted. And so why, why do you think Jesus said what he said? They doubted, and then Jesus said, All power is given unto me. Why did he say, All power is given unto me? Because they doubted. There was a doubting spirit about them. Jot this verse down. Mark 16, verse 14 and 15. Another instance of the Great Commission being mentioned here. Mark 16, 14, and 15. It says, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their, uh, with their unbelief and a hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Again, who was he talking to? The disciples. What kind of spirit did these men have? Unbelieving. Not only that, hard-hearted. So in Matthew, it said, but some doubted. But what was really the problem? Well, how did Mark look at it? Unbelief and hardness of heart. That's the spirit that they had in them. Yeah. Unbelief and hardness of heart. How would you describe God's Holy Spirit at this moment in their lives? Now, I know that Pentecost came, the Spirit came down and indwelled them. But let's just suppose that, okay, the Holy Spirit was... In, interacting in their lives. How do you think the Holy Spirit was interacting or how was he uh, 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 working in their lives? Would you describe it this way? 1 Thessalonians 5.19 Quench not the Spirit. You think he would have been quenched with hardness of heart and unbelief and doubt? Don't you think the Holy Spirit would have been quenched? I believe he would have been. Would you describe it this way? Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed under the day of redemption. Don't you think the Holy Spirit would be grieved with hardness of heart and unbelief and doubt? I believe he would. Because the Holy Spirit knows what the Father can do, but yet God's not going to force it upon a person. He's waiting for us to yield our free will, and if we will yield that free will, he will do a mighty work. Not if we don't believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Unbelief and hardness of heart and doubt. Should not their spirit rather have desired this? 2 Kings 2, 9, speaking of Elijah and Elisha, it says, And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. The disciples should have been asking Jesus, Before you ascend into heaven, would you put a double portion of your spirit upon me? They weren't doing that. They were filled with unbelief, hardness of heart, and doubt. Had they possessed that desire for a double portion of the right kind of spirit, their eyes would have been open to what was going on around them as Paul's spiritual eyes were in Athens. Pressed, stirred, aching, yearning. Jot this scripture down. It says in Acts 17, 17, 16, and 17, Now Paul, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. His spirit was stirred in him. Luke eleven thirty four says, The light of the body is the eye. Have you ever wondered what that means? The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy whole body is full of darkness. The eye, this eye that is speaking of here is your mind's eye. It's your spirit's eye. It's your spiritual level of discernment. How you're seeing things in the spirit world. The light of the body is the eye. Romans 1.9, again, Paul says, I serve God with my spirit. When Paul's spirit, little s, when he was in Athens, why was Paul's little spirit, little spirit, his little s spirit, stirred in Athens? Because his spirit's eye began to discern the darkness that was oppressing Athens. But when there's unbelief, hardness of heart, and doubt, 
You don't see it. You're concerned about where, 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 where's my food going to come from? Where, where's my needs going to be? You're all concerned about this instead of that. But Paul, how did Paul make ends meet? What have we learned about Paul and how did he make ends meet? Did he not make tents? Tent maker. He, he, so as he's making these tents and, and living pretty much from hand to mouth in Athens, he's watching all of this spiritual oppression going around and going on in the city. And his heart is heavy. Why? Because he's not hard-hearted, he's not unbelieving, and he's not doubting. He knows what God can do. Because his spirit's eye began to, began to discern the darkness that was oppressing uh, in, in Athens, that's why his spirit was stirred. He could see through his little s spirit, the capital S spiritual slavery that shackled the citizens of Athens. As we go around and see our area, do we see the same? But, but, you remember what, what, Paul, what, what Paul said? He said, you know what? I'm not just going to be stirred over the wickedness. I'm going to be pressed in my spirit to do something. And I'm not just going to be pressed to do something. I'm, going to be, I'm purposing to be an agent of change. And I'm bound in my spirit. I've got to do something about it. Maybe God brought it to my attention because he wants me to do something about it. That's why he later told young Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.6, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of, our, of my hands. Timothy, you cannot allow the oppressive spirit of this world to oppress your spirit. Stir it up. The Holy Spirit wants to do work. You'll end up like the disciples after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You'll get, you're going to end up getting scolded and corrected because of your unbelief and your hardness of heart and your doubt. Stir up the gift that is in you. None of us are immune. It doesn't matter who you are. None of us. It doesn't matter how long a person's been saved. None of us are immune. We all have to continue this work. Because Satan, he wants, to, he wants to douse our spirit. It reminds me of that story at the interpreter's house in the Pilgrim's Progress where, where Christian is taken by the interpreter to this, to this wall, this, this scene of this man and this fire at this wall. And this man would be throwing cold water on the fire. But every time he threw cold water on the fire, the fire would flame up higher. He asks Christian, the interpreter does, and says, does, do you understand what's going on here? Because it, it shouldn't make sense. It should have gone out. He said, let me take you to the back side of the wall. And now he was able to see both sides. And the moment that the guy put the cold water on the fire, there was one behind who put oil on the fire. Whoosh! Huh. That was Jesus Christ, a picture of Jesus Christ. Satan trying to douse the fire, but every time Satan does that, God, Jesus puts the, the oil of his fire, the oil of his Holy Spirit on the fire, and it flames higher, and, and it blows up right in his face. That's why Paul said, Timothy, stir up the gift that is in you. Don't let the fire go out. None of us are immune. Last week we saw that Paul's spirit was affected when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia. In Acts 18.5 it says, when Silas and Timotheus were come, from, when, uh, were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit. You see, he had endured his silent observation of Athens long enough, and he had to begin speaking out. He had to start saying something about it and being vocal about it. The eyes of Paul's spirit began to discern what was going on in the world around him so much that he made this determination in Acts 19 and verse 21. He says, I am purposed in my spirit. Paul purposed in his spirit when he passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. He was purposed in his spirit. He wasn't going to be like the disciples were after the resurrection. He wasn't going to be unbelieving. He wasn't going to be hard-hearted. He, he was going to practice what he preached. He was going to stir up the gift that was in him. He was going to, to stir up the Holy Spirit and get excited and, and, and take on the biggest fish that was out of there in the world. Rome. 
that leads me to some thoughts about the kind of spirit that believers should have. As a believer in Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior, this should be my life's goal. Revelation 4.11 Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. That ought to be our goal. And anything that detracts, anything in this world that detracts from that should take us off. It should make us upset. It should bother our spirit. It should stir us. It should press us. It should cause us to be purpose in our spirit. We're going we're gonna to do something about that because he is worthy, is he not? He is worthy. How can I achieve that goal as a believer? How can I cause God's heart's desire to be fulfilled? What's God's heart's desire? Fiddle around with mankind and when they die, they die? No. He wants them to come back to him. Spend eternity with him, but of their own free will. How can I cause God's heart's desire to be fulfilled? How can I put a smile on God's face? How can I bring joy to God's heart? John 6, says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Father has to draw his creature to him. How does God do this? Jot this verse down, John 12, verse 32. How does God, how does the Father draw his, his creatures to him, his, 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 his children to him? It says in John 12, 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus said that by him being lifted up from the earth, he would draw all men to the Father. This truth still works today. Number one, the lifting up of Christ causes the Holy Spirit to draw all men to the Father. If you, if, you, if you think about this, the lifting up of Jesus Christ causes all men to be drawn to the Father. I'm, I'm trying to imagine this in my mind, and I'm thinking, what part do we play? To me, it seems like Nothing more that, that God's children are nothing more than a rubber gasket in a pump. You know, when you have a pump and you pump it up and down, that thing is going like this. And what's it doing? It's, it's drawing up the water, is it not? It's drawing up that water. What is the secret to that water coming out of the well and into the pipe? Remember that story I told about the, the, the old well out in the, the, the western United States and, and this, this note that was written on a bottle under, there in the shade and it said it has enough water in the bottle for you to, to pour it down and get the gasket wet you know, and, and prime the pump and then it'll come and then don't, don't think about taking a sip before then because then you won't have enough water to get, to get the water out. But once she gets going, you can refill the jug and, and it's good for the next person. That's, that's us. The one thing that keeps the water that keeps that, that, that keeps the water from flowing up is a dry gasket. Is a gasket that's wasted, and we are that gasket. It doesn't sit well with our pride, does it? It's not seen. It's disposable, right? We want to think we're in. I want to be the handle. I want to be the ornate hand. No, we're just the gasket. When we're lifted, when, when we lift up Jesus Christ, it draws all men unto him. The lifting up of Jesus Christ causes the Holy Spirit to draw all men to the Father. Number two, believers can be a vital tool used by the Father to draw all men back to him. That's what God wants us to use us as, as a vital tool. He wants, to, he wants us to, to experience the joy of a, 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 a divine work, that, that having a part in a divine work that only he can do. How exciting that is. How exciting it is to, to be able to, 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 to meet a co-worker and, and help him when, when you had no idea that he was even contemplating eternity. And God worked that out. Amen. 
Believers can be a vital tool used by the Father to help to draw all men back to him. Number three, as a believer, I am to lift up Christ in every way so that the Holy Spirit can draw all men to the Father. I have to lift up Christ in every way. In every waking moment of my life, even in my sleeping moments, I ought to lift up Jesus Christ. Maybe I ought to have on my mask Jesus Christ. And every time I turn, it's Jesus Christ lifted up. (laughs) In every moment of of our existence, that ought to be our goal. I want to lift up Jesus Christ. In my entertainment, I want to lift up Jesus Christ. With my family, I want to lift up Jesus Christ. In my conversation, I want to lift up Jesus Christ. At my job, I want to lift up Jesus Christ. In my neighborhood, I want to lift up Jesus Christ. In my walk, I want to lift up Jesus Christ. I want to be an example and show the world Jesus Christ because only by lifting him up, then will the Holy Spirit be able to draw all men unto Jesus Christ for salvation. As a believer, I'm to lift up Jesus Christ in every way so that the Holy Spirit can draw all men to the Father. Number four, the spirit of the believer determines how high. The spirit of the believer determines how high. Jesus said at one time in Matthew 13, 58, he said, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He said of the children of Israel that they could not enter into his rest because of their unbelief. The spirit of the believer determines how high. The spirit of the believer determines how often. The spirit of the believer determines how many. If I have an unbelieving spirit, if I have a doubting spirit, if I have a hard-hearted spirit, I just refuse to go. How many people are going to get saved if I just refuse to go? If I refuse to talk, Because I got a hard-hearted spirit. None. You see, you see, it's a joy to be in the work of God. God is God is not gonna. He's not gonna force his children to experience the joy of working for him if they don't want to experience the joy of working for him. He's gonna keep our minds blinded to even the fact that we missed the joy of of getting to serve him. So we won't even know what we missed. We won't even know the, the fun that we missed. Have, has any of y'all, have any of you ever been to the Parque de Diversiones? What did you just say? He's speaking in tongues. By the, by the look on your face, I, I assume that you've never been to the Parque de Diversiones. Miss, miss moves over like, I ain't got a clue what you're saying. So you don't miss it, do you? I don't even know what you're talking about. It's an amusement park down in Costa Rica that I went to as a child. Not quite like Six Flags over here, but for me, it was, it was a lot of fun. So not even knowing about you didn't even know that you were supposed to miss it. It was, it was fun. You remember going as a four-year-old? You went as a four-year-old with our, with our neighbors. But that's, that's like working for the Lord. It's, it's when we have that unbelieving spirit, when we have that doubting spirit, when we have that hard-hearted spirit, the Holy Spirit, he, but Jesus can't do many mighty, many mighty works through us because of unbelief. So the spirit of the believer determines how high. Number five, the spirit of the believer determines how often. And the spirit of, number six, the spirit of the believer determines how many. After his resurrection, Jesus revealed to his disciples a real problem in their spirit. There was doubting. That's why he said, all power is given unto me. So remove the doubt. Trust me. Trust me. I don't care if you're a fisherman or a former tax collector or a former zealot. I don't care your former background. No, let's go out and win the world of Christ and make a difference for him. Trust me, all power is given. Satan's going to attack you, but all power is given unto me. I'm greater than Satan. 
He also revealed that there was unbelief. Anytime God wants to do a mighty work anywhere, if there's unbelief, it, it, it's, 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 it's like if you have a, a water system and you have a, a, the pressure, the, the, the pressure system, I'm learning about the, the pressure system at, over at our house. And if you have a leak in one of the tubes, it doesn't matter how hard the pressure is going, some of that pressure is not, the pressure is not going to the right place. It's going out in the tubes before it goes through the house. And you can't do a mighty work. Let's say a, 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 a fire department has the, the, the newest of the newest. They have a hovercraft fire truck. Have you ever seen one of those? They don't even touch the ground. They just hover, right? You've never seen? I've never seen one either. But let's imagine that they had have, they have the, new, the newest of the new, this alien spacecraft that they're just hovering and they're just going and beating all these fires. But there's a hole, there's a gaping hole in their hose. How effective are they going to be? Not very effective because it's going to lose pressure. And that's what unbelief is. Big hole in the hose. It starts with our spirit. Between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the day of Pentecost, Jesus impressed upon his disciples their need to, to tarry in Jerusalem until the Spirit endued them with power from on high. Notice how their spirit had changed in the 40 days since Jesus' ascension. Jot this verse down in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all in one accord in one place, do you think there was doubting going on then? Do you think there was unbelief going on then? Do you think hard-heartedness was going on then? And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house, filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And we know that Peter later on in that chapter stood, preached to the folks, focused on Jesus, lifted him up, and 3,000 were saved and baptized. They put out the fire. Every believer should make this the theme of their life, to lift up Jesus Christ in everything that they choose to do. To lift up Jesus Christ, because the lifting up of Christ causes the Holy Spirit to draw all men to the Father. Believers can be a vital tool used by the Father to draw all men back to Him. And as a believer, I am to lift up Christ in every way so that the Holy Spirit can draw all men to the Father. So the Spirit of the believer determines how high. And the Spirit of the believer determines how often. And the Spirit of the believer determines how many. Paul said, I serve, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit. Are you serving God with your spirit in a good way or, are you, or is there unbelief? Are you lifting up Jesus with your spirit or is there doubting, is there hard heartedness? It's something that we all need to look at ourselves and be very honest when we look in the mirror and ask ourselves, what kind, of a, what kind of spirit am I serving God with? Heavenly Father, I thank and praise you, Lord, for your love and care for us. I pray, Lord, that you please help us, Lord, as your children. Help us, Lord, as your children to, to look deep inside of us. And ask ourselves, what kind of spirit are we serving with? Are we like the disciples? Are we doubting? Are we hard-hearted? Are we unbelieving? Do we still believe that you can do a mighty work through our lives? Or are we just going with the flow of the world spirit? Seeking to please this old flesh. Living for the carnal lifestyle. Lord, there's a world dying and going to hell. There's people dying every second. Lord, may, may we claim our life, 
our routine of life, where we work, where we live, everything about our personal life, maybe claim that as our mission field and determine I'm going to lift up Jesus Christ in everything that I do, in the jokes that I tell, in the words that I speak, and let the world know. They're going to know at the judgment seat of Christ that a Christian was working with them because I'm going to talk about it so much. I'm not going to shove it down their throat and let the Holy Spirit do his work, but I'm not going to be afraid to speak about it. I'm going to speak about it. And I'm going to lift up Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to draw all men through everything that I do in my life, my words, my actions, the tenderness I show towards my coworkers, the tears that I shed with them or for them when they're going through hard times. I'm going to live it out. I pray, Lord, please fill this with your Holy Spirit. May our hearts be pressed. May our hearts be stirred. May they, may they ache inside because of the condition of the world around us. May it stir us to want to live every waking moment, every living moment of our day, of our life, lifting up Jesus Christ in every way we can so Jesus can have the privilege of reaching them with the message of salvation. The Holy Spirit can draw them to the Father, and the Father, his heart's desire, can be fulfilled. We can put a smile on his face and bring joy to his heart. I pray, Lord, you please help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand, please. And we're just going to be dismissed in, in prayer. Preacher, would you mind closing us in prayer? Uh, Mrs. Daniel had to go across the street to, to be with the children, okay?